just one study of so many studies out there correlating meat with disease, whether it is cancer or whatever it may be. On the same website, they say there is no safe amount of processed meat from hot dog to bacon. So God's ideal diet for us, what is it? It's a plant-based diet, which consists of vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, and seeds. This is um, one of my favorite health quotes by Ann Wigmore. It's taken from her book called The Sprouting Book, written back in 1909. And she says, the food you eat can be either the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. Another health quote by Dr. Hans Deal, and he says, health is not everything, but without it, everything is nothing. God demands that the appetite be cleansed and that self-denial be practiced in regards to those things which are not good. This is a work that will have to be done before his people can stand before him, a perfected people. We are to feel the power of the Spirit of God in this movement. This is a wonderful, definite message. It means everything to the receiver and is to be proclaimed with a loud cry. So this is something God demands of us, right? But it's a wonderful message. It's a message of hope and love, and we are to be excited about it. God does not require us to give up anything that it is not for our best interest to retain. In all that he does, he has the well-being of his children in view. Man is doing the greatest injury and injustice to his own soul when he thinks and acts contrary to the will of God. No real joy can be found in the path forbidden by him who knows what is best and who plans for the good of his creatures. So God might be asking us to give up some things, right? But he created us. We're created in his own image. He wants the best for us and knows what that is. With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26. We might feel discouraged and think, I can't do this, and we can't of our own strength. But if we ask God for his help, we have the assurance through his promises that he will help us. So let's remember to put good things into our body to give him all the glory. Good morning. Good morning. So, fun fact, maybe. Did you know that inactivity provides for similar negative health effects as seen in a person who smokes a pack of cigarettes a day? In fact, the World Health Organization ranks inactivity as the fourth highest risk factor for chronic illnesses. So I have a short activity for you all this morning. Can everyone that is able please stand? So how many of you like coconuts? <laughs> Good, so we're going to do a stretch and you just kind of repeat after me, okay? okay. We're gonna go C, O, C, O. Stretch down for N, N. up for U, U, and out for T. Yeah. And wave your arms. Good, thank you, you can sit down. So exercise, my name's Charles Larson and today I will talk to you a little bit about exercise. Starting from the Bible, Proverbs chapter 24 and verse five states, a wise person is full of strength and a person of knowledge enhances their might. You might be thinking, why should I move every day? Why is exercise good for me? Well, I'll give you some answers, but let's first go through an anecdote. One time I was getting a haircut in Boulder, Colorado, just the usual, nothing too fancy. So the barber sits me down and the conversation starts before the haircut and they both move slowly. Um, the barber goes for an easy question though and asks how old I am, so I answer. And then he pops the big question and asks if I can guess how old he is. I felt like a deer caught in the headlights, but I mustered some courage and uh, came up with the best guess that I could reason. I figure if somebody asks me that question, then they think they look younger than they actually are. So I'm gonna answer a higher number, but not too high, because I don't want to offend, right? So I answered 55, and he chuckles. Then he tells me he just turned 82. As you heard my reasoning, I, I was astonished. He could tell too and quickly followed up with, do you want to know my secret? Move every day, he offered and then proceeds to tell me about his 4 a.m. runs in the brisk weather. So why is exercise good for me? Exercise is known to be beneficial for all functions of the body. As Grace mentioned, the body is some very fine machinery, and it is built to move. The more you exercise, the more you can keep exercising. 
According to the Mayo Clinic and Centers for Disease Control, exercise namely improves brain health. Exercise strengthens the bones and muscles. Exercise not only reduces the risk for diseases, but in many cases can actually reverse them. And exercise helps to manage weight gain and weight loss. If you still need more persuasion, let's turn to the Bible. In the first book of Corinthians, the Apostle Paul reminds us of something both solemn and refreshing. The verse reads, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now that we know why we should exercise, the next question may naturally be, how much should we exercise? According to the Mayo Clinic and Centers for Disease Control, it is recommended for us to have 150 minutes of aerobic exercise per week. We can break that down roughly into 30 minutes of aerobic exercise daily and pair it with two days a week of muscle strengthening activities. Studies have found that regular aerobic exercise in midlife, including brisk walking, biking, swimming, actually forestalls memory problems that often come with aging and can also improve the brain function of adults with mild cognitive impairment. That's great, right? But 150 minutes muscle training activities? When am I supposed to fit all this exercise into my busy schedule? How can I find time to go to the gym? Or maybe there's a pandemic and I can't leave my house. But don't worry, exercise can be as simple as taking a brisk 30 minute walk. Just remember the important part is to move every day. You can take a walk after your meal, it will help digestion. You can take a walk in the morning, it will help you get going. You can take a walk during work to break up the hours and refocus your mind. Additionally, you can go for a bike ride, you can take a Sabbath afternoon hike and enjoy the sunshine and God's beautiful creation. Or if you or a friend have a pool, swim some laps. As for muscle activities, there are many that you can do in the comfort of your own living room using your own body weight, whether you are a beginner or an Olympian. They call it calisthenics, I just recently found out. But remember to run with patience the race that is set before us, before you. Take your time, go at your own pace, because changes happen gradually. But if you only get 1% better every day, in about three months you will have improved by 100%, eh? The goal is consistency. My final appeal to you is the same one that Paul gave in his letter to the Christians in Rome. I implore you, I entreat you, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Remember, that's one of the, uh, the things that exercise helps with. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Remember to move every day and enjoy the rest of your seminar. Good morning. I'm Kathy and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about water. Um, okay. Water appears as a clear, a non-toxic liquid composed of hydrogen and oxygen and it is essential for life and it is the mi most widely used solvent. Just look at the Grand Canyon. They tell me that water did that. And it took millions, hundreds of millions of years. I don't believe it took that long. I think maybe like 150 days or so. <laughs> God gave us water to hydrate us and cleanse us. Here we have the water cycle. Water is stored in the ocean, evaporates into the skies and clouds, excuse me, and is dispersed onto the dry land, nourishing all creation. <clears throat> it goes into the streams and rivers and into the ground and then it eventually returns to the ocean where it continues the cycle of giving, the cycle of love, the circle of love, of never-ending giving. It reminds me of the love of God, never-ending giving. So if water is the cycle of life and it's essential for life, what is it good for? 
Drinking water is good for lubricating the joints. Um, cartilage found in the discs of the spine and the knee, for instance, are 80% water. Long-term dehydration can reduce the joint shock absorbing ability, leading to joint pain and deterioration. Water is good for delivering oxygen throughout the body. Through the blood and your, through the blood, and your blood is 90% water when it is hydrated. Water is good for the digestive system, it and it depends on water to function. Dehydration can lead to digestive problems like constipation and an overly acidic stomach, and this increases the risk of heartburn and stomach ulcers. The bowels also need water to work properly. Water is good for flushing body wastes. It's needed in the processes of sweating and removing urine. And water helps to maintain proper blood pressure. Lack of water can cause blood to become thicker, which increases your blood pressure. Your airways need water. When dehydrated airways are restricted by the body in an effort to minimize water loss, this can make asthma and allergies worse. You also need water to help the body use the nutrients and min minerals that you consume. These minerals are water soluble, meaning they dissolve in water, which makes it possible for them to reach the different parts of the body. During everyday functioning of the body, <coughs> excuse me, we lose water through actions such as sweating, fever, vomiting, and diarrhea, and even breathing. Drinking water is the best source of fluid for the body because it is God's design. But when, and when you calculate how much water you need, there are formulas for that, and um, there was one mentioned already today. Mine is a little different, I think. It depends on whether you're pregnant or breastfeeding, or whether you're working in the hot sun, or your, and it depends on your overall health and your uh, exercise activity. And there is a formula to figure it out, how much you need. Um, let's say you weigh 160 pounds, and half of 160 pounds is 80, so you would need 80 ounces of water per day, which is about 10 cups. This is not a hard and fast rule, depending on the previous slide that we discussed. Increasing your water intake may seem easy, but it's hard for some. Uh, some people just don't like the taste of water. So let's explore some ways to increase your water intake. You can flavor it by adding fruit, or like lemons or oranges, or cucumbers or watermelon, and you can also add herbs. You can tie it to a routine, like brushing your teeth. Every time you brush your teeth, drink a glass of water. Or you can set a timer on your watch or your phone to drink a glass of water every hour. You can throw out a challenge to your friends or family to see who can drink their quota of water every day. And you can take it with you where you go, wherever you go. I see that here. Everybody does that. Um, let's see. We can also use hot water for hydrotherapy, like we discussed earlier. It acts through the nervous system, like medication. It acts on the brain centers and their extensions, and even through, and then through the reflex areas. Here are some things that hydrotherapy is good for. The common cold, pneumonia, sore throat, backache, <laughs> and arthritis, and just general pain. Um, so you see, water is great. Water is life. To the same degree that we need wa the Holy Spirit, we need water. Without one or the other, we would die. And Jacques Cousteau once said, the water cycle and the life cycle are one. Thank you, and have a blessed and hydrated day. Amen. Good morning, sunshine, is how my father would always greet me in the morning. <laughs> I did not feel like sunshine whatsoever. I felt like I want to stay in the darkness, but praise God, I learned the benefits of sunlight, and I want to share that with you too. Some of the benefits are strengthening the immune system, producing vitamin D, improving your mood, and the quality of sleep, and how many individuals are really getting the sleep that they need, correct? Um, 
so it's important to let that sunlight in. You know, in the early 20th century, it was actually used to help kill the bacteria tuberculosis. Um, they did many experiments, of which I wish I had the time. I could just tell you some of them. It's awesome experiments that they did. Um, but sunlight is very effective in killing that bacteria. Um, in the past, hospitals and sanitariums used to actually open up their window, had big windows to allow the sunshine to come in. They would put it to the east because the sunrise in the east. They would put it in the east, allow the sunlight to get in. Um, but do we have that today? Uh, you go into a hospital, you go into some of these places for sickness, and you have to put on lights. What does that tell you? It's dark, right? And that means that it's, um, some ventilation issues might be there also. Um, so, an amazing fact, during the Spanish flu of 1918, there were many patients, they put in what's called overflow tents. And they would, um, oftentimes, those who were recovering, they would put them out and let them have um, air and let them have the sunlight. And they actually had a greater recovery rate than those who didn't. So that, that speaks a lot about the power of sunlight and the effect it has on the system. So how much do you need in order to get the vitamin D? Because that's what a lot of people think about. Um, oh, I need my vitamin D. And praise the Lord, God is so good. The sun is shining right there. And the Bible says it shines on the just and the unjust. You know how good God is? That means even the criminal walking down the street, guess what he's getting? The blessings of sunlight. God is no respecter of persons. But he hopes that every man would see what? How beautiful they are in his sight. I still want to bless you no matter what you do. So vitamin D, um, the darker your complexion, the more time in the sun you need. So if you're fair skin, you need about 20 minutes, darker skin, 30 to 40 minutes. The principle is don't get burnt, <laughs> right? And we'll, we, can, we can talk a lot more about that. Um, what is vitamin D exactly? It's a natural type or one of the types of, that's made from the skin, um, a cholesterol under the skin called 7-dehydrocholesterol. That won't be on the exam like the end. Only new start will be on your exam. Um, and how exactly is it formed? So God who created the sunlight allowed those specifically UVB rays to shine on the sun, uh, your skin. So the skin exposure, when your skin is exposed, you get that sunlight on the skin. It works with that 7-dehydro um, cholesterol and that gets converted. We're not going to go through that process, but it's a beautiful process that happens in your liver and in your kidneys that gets converted, that gets converted, that gets converted. But people will give you the short answer. It gets converted into a type of... Um, functional or usable um, vitamin D where the body can use. But it's, it's metabolized in your liver and in your kidneys. Um, so this is Ruth. Ruth. I'm watching Ruth right now, that's why. Uh, so the best time to get it, the exposure is between 10 and 3. Now sometimes you're going to see early morning and late morning. Now realize what we just learned about this sunlight is that the UVB rays specifically is what helps to convert that um, the 7 d the hydro cholesterol. So if that's the case, then we want to get the most UVB rays as we can. But because we know the sun is more intense in that area, you don't need it for as long a duration. So get out in the sun. I see some people here from the Bahamas. I'm sure you get in your sun, amen? I, 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 get, I put that in there for you. Um, so you get in a little bit of your sun. Make sure you get the sunlight, but you don't want to get burned. Even being a darker complexion, you can still get burned. You want to be careful. Temperance in all things. You're going to learn that next. Vitamin D sources, sunlight, and supplements. So I came from Maine, and in Maine, because the winters are like six to seven months of winter, I had to take some supplements also, um, which helped me. And I realized the difference. I used to think, oh, it's just in their mind. Nope, mood makes a difference. You, you need that help. So I learned the, um, the church members learned the hard way from me, or dealing with me. Vitamin D has long been known to help the body absorb and retain calcium, um, because vitamin D is necessary for calcium uptake and another process. It's the key to having a proper balance of calcium and magnesium in the body. Now, vitamin D and the immune system. So your T-killer cells that Ashwin talked about earlier, part of that pathway of the immunology, how the immune system works, um, the T-cells or killer cells are needed in order to, um, sunlight is needed in order to activate. It helps activate those, those cells. So if somebody can come deficient in that, which means they can also become deficient in the activation of those T-cells. Um, going out and working on any threats that the body may have. So this is one thing you want to do. You don't want them to be dormant, right? You want them to be active. So um, also vitamin D and mood, right? So how are you feeling today? Are you happy? Are you sad? If you're happy or you're not happy, praise God, you can go walking in the sunlight because it helps with your serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter. And it helps with things like digestion and wound healing, um, bones, because what we talked about with the need of that to uptake calcium. Um, so it, ha it associated or helps with your mood. And so sun exposure actually can help those levels 
to rise or non-sun exposure, it can cause those to drop. And also because serotonin is important to make melatonin, um, then you can see the importance of sun. So when it gets dark, your body starts to form melatonin. Right? So this is important of getting the sunlight. And the beautiful part of this is um, when you get it early in the morning, when that sun hits you early in the morning, then it, it shows that studies are showing that it helps you sleep better at nighttime also. Um, so it regulates your sleep cycle and helps your body when you need to increase or decrease your melatonin levels. And the better the body will produce melatonin when you get more sunlight, basically, as we talked about. Um, so just kind of a summary, it improves your bone health. It, it only takes about 5 to 15 minutes, depending on your complexion, to start boosting your vitamin D levels. And it keeps the nervous system and muscles working properly, which is what we want. And um, did you want to take a picture of that just now? No, you're okay. Okay. Sorry, this one, this one, this one, this one. Oh, okay, I didn't know if you wanted to take a picture. I don't want you to miss out. But you can talk to me. We can get you something. Um, so sunlight boosts your serotonin, improves your sleep cycle, and it kills tuberculosis and treats other diseases. It helps you recover from sickness. If the windows were freed from blinds and heavy curtains and the air and sun permitted to enter freely, the darkened room, there would be seen a change for the better in the mental and physical health of the children. The pure air would have an invigorating influence upon them, and the sun that carries healing in its beams would soothe and cheer and make them happy, joyous, and healthy, just by introducing more sunlight into a room. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, had shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So may the Lord bless you as you get more sunlight. All right, 1221, let's make this short and not too sweet. All right, today we're going to talk about temperance. What is temperance? Uh, which of us don't know what temperance is in this room? <laughs> One guy, Richard, I'm pretty sure you know what temperance is. And that's the crazy thing, because most of us already know what this is. Um, what is it? Well, we're not talking about the prohibition. Um, the Bible talks about temperance. It says, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance. But what is that? How do you add it to your life? So, and yes, being temperate in all things, absolutely. But how do you do that? So let's go to the Bible. I like this verse in Proverbs 30, verse 8. It reminds me of the Lord's Prayer in which Jesus told us to Give us this day our daily bread. It says, remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. And in Proverbs 24, 13, it says, my son, eat thou honey, because it is good, and the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. But just a few chapters later, he says, hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. So in order to get us all on the same page as to what temperance actually is, I want to take us to the story of Samson and his parents, Manoah and his wife. So they were instructed by an angel how to raise this child, and they were instructed to raise him temperately with the principles of temperance. Now, what is this? Um, I like this passage in Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, page 562, paragraph 1. It says, true temperance teaches us to dispense entirely with everything hurtful and to use judiciously that which is healthful. Now this is a very important passage and I would read the rest to you, but we gotta move on for time's sake. Go to that passage, it's very important. But this is what my uh, teacher for one of my lifestyle classes distilled it down to. Temperance means moderation in all that is beneficial and abstinence from all that is harmful. And that's a little easier for me to understand and recall when it's important, and when is it important? Every day. Um, so what does this actually mean? Moderation and abstinence. We have two principles that we're working with here. Well, abstinence is easier to define because, as you can see on the screen, abstinence means no, not at all. At no point in time would we agree that any of these things is a good idea. Maybe some of us would agree that a couple of them are, but. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, we'll just say they're all on the no list. Um, now, 
Normally I talk about social drinking. Okay, social drinking is something we've invented, I feel like, in the last few decades. Where, and maybe they had it in ancient times, but essentially the idea is, okay, I'm in a social situation, I cannot be temperate because uh, this reason or that reason, but it's mainly to be cool. Well, let me tell you one thing. Temperance may not preserve your coolness, but it will preserve your life. And that's what's important, not people's opinions. Um, now, we talked about Doritos earlier, um, and we also talked about Hans Deal earlier. The thing is, um, he said one time in a presentation that I heard by him that e eating M&Ms won't kill you. And it sounded like a very bold statement, but then he followed with, if you only eat one. And the truth is, most of us don't stop at one, and that's the issue. So sometimes um, people can put this on their list as a little bit, some of the time, but sometimes it's just easier to abolish it completely. Uh, likewise, sweets. You can read in the Spirit of Prophecy and a lot of different medical journals about the consumption of sweets, and it never condemns it. It doesn't say that eating sweets is bad. However, eating sweets intemperately is bad and negatively affects health. So one cookie, uh, two cookies, good. The whole box, maybe not so good. Um, likewise, food. Food is a very good thing. God has given us food to enjoy, all, all things to enjoy richly. And uh, you can over-enjoy that as well. So like the proper amount, great. Overeating, not so great. Um, likewise, technology. Um, technology is very useful, but we can often use it intemperately. Work. God gave us work as part of our story of redemption. And uh, we can also overuse that. So moderation in all things, and it's a daily choice. This is the right use of the will, and it means that we have to surrender it to Christ. And it's a personal daily journey. I like this quote by Mark Twain. Um, it says, temperate temperance is best. Intemperate temperance injures the cause of temperance. And the reason why I really like this is just because a lot of the times when we learn these things and they're new to us, and we want to implement them immediately, and you know, go the extra mile, and that's all great. We have to remember that all of these changes take place gradually. So we have to take some steps and then rest, but then continue taking steps forward. If we try to do it all in one day, we'll burn out and then not make any progress. And in fact, a lot of times, lose progress. So I would say to that that we need balance, and your balance might not look like someone else's. We also have to remember to breathe. And I like this, uh, not necessarily for the benefit of air, although deep breathing is incredible, but um, someone important to me taught me one time that breathing is important because it centers you mentally. So a lot of these things are an important choice, and they're daily choices. And when they come up in our face and we're like, what do I do? Just remember to breathe, and the Holy Spirit will tell you what is the right choice? Prayer, of course, is the breath of the soul. It's the only way that we can be successful with exercising temperance. So thank you for listening and have a temperate day. Good afternoon, my name is Paulina and the next health law is air. So what is air? Air is part of the Earth's atmosphere that we breathe also, air is mostly gases, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% other gases, such as carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and neon. Thank you. Sorry. So, according to a U.S. Geographical Survey, the average person can live one week without water, four to six weeks without food. But what about air? I mean, oh wait, hold on. Sorry. Sorry. the average person can live two to three minutes before they pass out. Six to nine minutes will cause irreversible damage to the brain. So let's look into the cause of the lack of oxygen. The first cause is poor breathing habits. Do you normally breathe from your mouth or from your nose? Nose, yes, we breathe in from your nose, exhale from your mouth. Breathing from our nose is ideal to protect our lungs because breathing from the nose, it, um, the cilia, the nose hairs, humidifies and dehumidifies the air by filtering the warmth or 
or cool temperature, and the nose hairs also traps and destroys microorganisms. While Job was deprived of his worldly possessions and so afflicted in body, he states in chapter 27, verse 3, as long as my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Um, but how did God form us? In Genesis 2, 7, it states, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life and the man became a living creature. So did you, wait, hold on. So shallow breathing is a learned habit often caused by bad posture. Bad, bad posture increases carbon dioxide levels in the blood, which makes us feel tired. Another cause of lack of oxygen is lack of exercise. Did you know that the exercise promotes proper growth, increases oxygen to the body, raises the number of red blood cells, which facilitates the transportation of oxygen, also improves the oxygen flow in the body and in the brain. Another cause of lack of oxygen is smoking. As we, as we know, smoking causes, I mean, damages our lungs. According to the American Lung Association, smoking harms every body organ and kills over 393,000 people annually. Also, um, smoking causes 90% of lung cancers, deaths, 80 to 90% of chronic bronchitis and emphysema deaths. Emphysema means unable to exhale. Also, 126,000 non-smoking Americans are exposed to secondhand smoke at home and at work. Secondhand smoke exposure causes nearly 50,000 deaths in adult non-smokers in the U.S. each year. Also, tight clothing. Uh, tight clothing is another cause of lack of oxygen. Picture A is a normal... Uh, body, the body organs are placed where they should be. However, in picture B, a woman is wearing a corset. Over time, tight clothing will shift your organs. If there are red marks on your body, that means that the clothes are too tight, which prevents from having a healthy circulation. And lastly, high fat diet causes lack of oxygen. Hold on, I'm sorry. Um, high fat diet clogs red blood cells. The red blood cells transports oxygen throughout the body. So has anyone ever heard of negative charged ion? Well, I have until recently. It is found in the ocean waves or any moving water, such as waterfalls and rivers. Also around evergreen trees, natural outdoor environments, and even in the showers. So negative air ions is a good air. That is what we want. Oxygen releases uh, negative ionized air. However, the negative air ion, ion can be destroyed. It can be destroyed in um, air conditioners, heaters. Um, also, in tobacco smoke, city smog and other pollutants such as airborne particles like dust, mold, spores, and floating pollutants, and long dry periods. But what is God's solution to get out of the cities? So let's look into some good benefits of good air. Um, good air improves function of the lungs by the protection of cilia. A good respiration soothes the nerves, increases the rate and quality of growth in plants and animals. Also good air, um, Gives us the ability to work more efficiently, promotes sound, refreshing sleep, improves our memory, also boosts our daytime energy, alleviates depression, and improves our memory. I would like to leave you with a spiritual lesson to meditate upon, and it states, In the matchless gift of his Son, God has encircled the whole world with an atmosphere of grace, as real as the air, which circulates around the globe. All who choose to breathe this life-giving atmosphere will live and grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda, and I will be talking about rest. I think we can all agree that rest is important, right? It's just as important as exercise, um, drinking enough water, eating the right foods, and it can affect us if we don't get enough, right? Um, I'm, I'm sure we all don't get enough rest. That's something we all struggle with. So first things first, what is rest? So this is Merriam-Webster's definition. Um, the first definition is to repose or to sleep, or basically what we do at night, right? We just sleep. The second definition is freedom from activity or labor. I think this is a great definition, but it's also, you know, compacted. So I think it, we, this can be um, elaborated into five different types of rest. So let's go through them. The first thing, first type of rest is daily rest, which is what we do at like the, the first definition of um, Merriam-Webster's definition. So did you guys know that we spend one third of our life sleeping? That means that if you live to 80 years old, you would have spent almost 27 years of your life sleeping. That's a lot. <laughs> the next type of rest is um, weekly rest, which is what we do on the Sabbath, right? Next, recreation and rest. This is when you go on a walk, you exercise, you work on a project. Uh, meditation rest is also whenever you, you know, you come to God, you pray, you study, things like that. And the final one is death rest. So why is rest important? According to the National Institute of Health, it says it helps with cellular restoration in the body, and it also helps flush out toxins in the brain. Healthline.com says that it affects brain function, such as memory, learning, problem-solving skills, focus. It also helps with emotional well-being, and also helps you lower your blood pressure and with your immunity. So how do you know that you're getting enough rest? I guess we can look at um, how we feel, right? So, tired, right? That's the obvious one. Do you feel tired? But maybe you're not able to focus throughout the day. Um, yeah, maybe you're anxious, or maybe you're moody or depressed, or even have, or even eating less or more than you usually do. This is, so how much sleep do we need per day? So for around 18 to 64 years old, you'll need seven to nine hours of sleep per night. 65 plus, you'll need seven to eight hours of sleep per night. What happens when you don't get enough sleep? By not sleeping enough, you can have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, obesity, and Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is caused by a buildup of a certain toxic protein in the brain. And as we talked about, sleep helps with getting rid of those proteins, right? And it can also make you more accident prone. According to the Sleep Foundation, those who were sleepy were 70% more likely to have workplace related accidents and 33% more likely to have an accident on the road. There was an interesting study done between two healthy groups of adults. Um, one group of adults had seven hours of sleep per night. The other one had four, six, interchangeably per night, four, six, or eight hours of sleep per night. Um, they were woken up at the same time in the morning. Their caffeine was restricted. And after 14 days, they took a test. They found some very interesting things with the second one. So they had less cogn cognitive thought in the second uh, group, and they also had, they were more depressed, and they also had slower reaction times. But another thing that I found very, very, very interesting was that they couldn't tell that they were sleepy. Even though they were chronically deprived of sleep, they still couldn't tell that they were sleepy. So their body had gotten used to it. So how do I sleep or rest better? Well, it's recommended that we don't use our phones, laptops, computers, etc., at least an hour before going to sleep. Another thing is no caffeine. Uh, the Sleep Foundation that says caffeine can make you fall asleep later, sleep less hours overall, and make your sleep feel less satisfying. This includes coffee, tea, Mountain Dew, and yes, even chocolate. Next thing is to pray, which is the most important thing, right? A good diet, as Grace talked about, um, a plant-based diet. The Sleep Foundation recommends a Mediterranean diet, which is very similar to a plant-based diet. Um, also, not eating late at night. This is something that I used to struggle with, and you know, sometimes we all struggle with this. Um, it's recommended that we eat at least three hours or more before going to sleep. That's something light, right? Not something like nuts or um, something heavy, you know. Um, if you eat right before going to sleep, it'll still be digesting in your, sis in your system, so that'll take away from the quality of your sleep, right? And also be regular. Our body's circadian rhythm really, really, really likes regularity, regularity, and that includes waking up and going to sleep around the same times, even on the weekends, unfortunately. <laughs> Another thing is to get more sunshine, um, as Jai talked about. So what are some foods 
that help. Um, these are the main, one that talk, main ones that I found that people talk about. So nuts, kiwis, tart cherry juice, and rice. Um, most of these foods have either like um, omega-3s, they help you produce serotonin, melatonin, things like that, which, you know, all of these things help you feel better or just, you know, sleep better. Uh, what about herbs? Not many t people talk about herbs. Um, I'm just going to put a whole list. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you can look at the list. Um, with these, you can do a lot. You can make a tincture. You can, um, you can make a tea with it. Um, you can take it in capsule form, which is what I did a couple years ago. Was that a couple? Yes, a couple years ago. <laughs> um, I was having trouble sleeping. Um, I had a lot of things in my brain and, I mean, on my mind. And, you know, I took these, and they actually really, really, really helped with my sleep. Yeah, it, it's great. And it's amazing that God has made things, these things for us um, to, to enjoy. And another thing about herbs is that if you are taking medication, make sure this doesn't, you know, clash with your medication. So I'm going to end with a Bible verse, Matthew 11:28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So it seems that God wants us to have rest. We can see in countless other scriptures found in the Bible that God wants us to have rest. He constantly tells us to trust in him. This is the only way we can find true peace, which is a huge part in getting quality rest. We can be drinking chamomile tea or going to sleep at 8 o'clock, waking up at 5. But that doesn't mean we're truly rested. We need to come to the feet of Jesus and give everything to him. May we take Jesus' invitation today and trust him and him only. Thank you. Okay. Wow, that was very interesting. We're learning a lot here, aren't we? Well, that sounds like everyone's tired. It sounds like somebody's hungry. Well, we're going to make this quick. We're going to try to end this quickly. That way I can get you all to lunch. So as you can see here, my name is Jael, and today we're going to be talking about trust in God. Um, a very simple topic, so shouldn't be much time here. First, we're going to take a look at the meaning of the word trust in God. And, well, the meaning of the word trust, really. So a firm belief or reliability or ability, a firm belief, reliability, truth, re ability, or strength of someone or something. Relationships must be built on trust. You must be able to win the trust of a friend, right? How many of you have a best friend here? I hope everyone does, because right, that, that's, that's one of the best things, right? And whether you're married or not married, if you're married, you know, Richard, your, your best person should be your wife. Is that right? Yeah, all right. So the meaning of the word trusting God. Trusting God means holding to God all day long, trusting him to be present in every situation, moment, or feeling you might be in. Trusting in God is being vulnerable and communicating to him constantly, praying to him during the good, bad, stressful, and joyous moments of life. So now we're going to look at health benefits. You know, I recently learned that there are health benefits from trusting in God. A new report indicates that those that those who believe in God not only, have, not only live a healthier life, but also may also add as much as 14 years to their life. How many of us want to live 14 extra years? Amen. I saw a little two less hands come up. I mean, I expected the whole church. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Christian. And another health benefit from this is, according to the new report published in Christian Medical Fellowship, those who have faith carry positive health benefits, such as coping with illnesses, faster recovery, as well as protection from future illnesses, which is great, right? Because how many of us want to recover fast from a disease, from a common cold? Too much time spent in a bed, right? Um, so now we're going to look quickly at one person from the Bible. His name was Job. Job. Same way, same. Wow. <laughs> it's spelled the same way, but just pronounced in a different way. I'm, I'm, yeah, it's, yeah, bear with me here. Um, so Job was a very rich man, but yet very loyal to God. And, but who had a plan in his life to touch everything Job had? Great. I'm saying the name right. Just got to clear myself. Satan. Um, so, jo so as we see here, Satan went down, came down to earth to come and touch everything Job had. And at that time, so at that time, I'm drawing a blank. Wow. Okay. So he came down and Job was a very rich man, very loyal to God. God allowed Satan to take everything from him but his life, you know, so Satan couldn't take everything from his life. It's a very story that we all should know, and if you don't know, it's a really good book to read, 
And so as we see in that story, Job ends up losing everything but his life. He even lost his wife. His wife, not exactly lost his wife, but he lost, his wife was telling him to sin and just die. So at that point, it's like he lost his wife. He just wasn't there for him. And at that point, you feel like if I was in Job's feet, I would have felt like just, you know, just die at that point. Because you're in sickness. The best way to go is just death. That's what it seems like. That's what Satan would be telling him. But as we see, he clinged to Jesus. He asked Jesus for help. And he had great company around him. He surrounded himself with great company. And um, later on in the story, God rewarded him with everything, double of everything he had. And he got re rewarded back everything he has in his life. Yeah, which is really good. So now, this experience, how this experience of Job translates into our life today. Well, we see a story of a man who lost everything, right? So it is that if we lose everything, God's going to be there for us. God's going to be there for us to take us out of our problems, our, our hardships in life. And so it is that when you're here and you're learning everything, this must be, might, some things here might seem hard to put to practice. But God is there for you, and he's going to be there for you to help you through this. And if you call to him, he's there for you, right? He's waiting for you, but he's not going to go and shove himself into your heart. you got to be there and open the door to him, and he'll come in without any hesitation. So I'm going to leave you with this last verse here. It's from Psalms 91.15. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him and honor him. So is God to our life, right? He's waiting for us to call upon him first. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God is so good. So we learned from um, Dr. Randall the importance of not pill power but willpower in God. That if we will give his will, our will to him, he can bless and use us. We learned from Dr. Eric the importance of um, things that could help us with our hypertension, some of the supplements, but also a trust in God, right? When, when the, the CoQ10s and the, all the water therapy isn't working, the mind needs to be at peace with the Lord to give us true peace. Praise God for the fever treatments. God has given us the water, but don't forget, God created the water. The water of life wants to help you in your life. And as you submerge yourself in that water for hydrotherapy, remember that's God desiring to embrace you. His, his desire to be next to you. And with these principles that you've learned, you can also choose today, while it is called today, to have a new start in the Lord. If you can, pray, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings. Lord, thank you for these simple remedies. You are a simply complex God, O oh Lord God. Enough simplicity for the simple in mind to understand, but enough complexity to baffle the scientists. Lord, we love you. We thank you that you have revealed these things unto babes. We ask for your presence. Bless the lunch and the period that we're going to have now to fellowship and to eat. May you help us to choose wisely in nourishing our temples for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>